Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Um, Unitarians and Social Responsibility, big title, uh, a bit more down to earth. Why are you bothered with that? Well, there's no need to take notes, if, even if you're wanting to. There, there will be a handout. I've put the text of what I've said. There's some copies over there. There's also copies of a newspaper article that I thought was relevant and of interest. And also, there are copies of the hot off the press, send a child to Hucklow newsletter. Please do take them. Uh, there are plenty more on our stall. Um, if reading that doesn't bring tears to your eyes, then you seriously need counselling. <laughs> For a teen of years, I have served as Honorary Secretary of the Send a Child to Hunklo Fund, doing the basic administration of sending groups of children from disadvantaged backgrounds for holidays at the Unitarian Nightingale Holiday Centre in Derbyshire. You can see the website for all the details. Send a child to Hooklow altogether, small case. Send a child to hooklow.org.uk. I hope you and your congregation support us. I'm very passionate about it. My task is almost a no-brainer. What to say beyond the obvious? Being a Unitarian implies a commitment to social responsibility. But let's consider a little more. Why and how? And why bother? And then the problem, of course, is the mere ten-minute slot that I've been allocated. Well, here follows a bit of biblical study, a bit of theology, and some of me. Christian history is suffused with the debate of faith versus works. Why do I refer to Christian history? Well, Judeo-Christianity happens to be my ethnic faith background and the spiritual wayposts are the ones that I am most familiar with and have found I can work with. The Epistle of James in the Christian scriptures, that's the New Testament in old money, states, some people know, will know this quote, faith without works is dead. It, that's the epistle of James, has been described as a manual of practical religion. It has always been popular with Unitarians, of the previous generation at least. The, car, the writer cautions against claiming that you have faith if you do nothing to show it. But interestingly, in fact, mentions faith early on and considers by implication motivation for doing. In there are notes, there are some notes on the Greek words used and the English translation in both the King James authorised version and the revised English Bible, a modern one. They're on the handout. And it directs you to particular verses. Moving swiftly on some 1,500 years, compare this with Martin Luther, the 500th anniversary of whose reformatory 95 theses was marked last year. He described the epistle dismissively as the epistle of straw. As a Catholic monk, he tried to feel justified, that is to say, okay about himself, about his life and human being and his relation to the Almighty, he tried to feel all right by doing good works, very scrupulously, and failed. Luther elicited the notion of salvation by grace through faith, often misquoted as salvation by faith, something of a motto of Protestantism implying that A, it's not a matter of right intellectual believing, and B, it's beyond our human marking. Moving on again, we can compare this with the Unitarian salvation by character statement in the 19th century Five Principles of James Fleet Freeman Clark. 
You might find these hanging up somewhere in the back of a chapel that you happen to know of. Hanging in there, of course, no pun intended, is the question of what do we mean by salvation? Well, for present purposes, I'm thinking in terms of how to be a proper human being. So on to now, and me. I find a resolution of the seeming contradiction in Paul Tillich's 20th century elucidation of the true meaning of faith, as expressed not least in his The Dynamics of Faith, first published in 1953, which means it's probably now about contemporary for theology. theology. He was German and fled Nazism to America in the 1930s. Tillich was Lutheran, tracing a line from the Apostle Paul, the corrupter of Christianity in the view of some scholars, that's another consideration that I'm parking, from Paul to Augustine, the medieval scholar who, in my view, should have ignored his mother and married the pagan lass, <laughs> to Luther himself. Tillich was also a great friend of the Unitarian James Luther Adams, whose writings I commend to your attention. He, Tillich, offers an equation, and here I need the help of a glamorous assistant. I don't mind the gender. <laughs> Cliff, <laughs> would you assist me a minute, very quickly? I've only got two hands, so... And get this the right way around. Would you hold that one? Just hold that up. That's, and then with your other hand, cup out of that end. Right. This, can you all see that? Yes. It's a sort of e equation. Faith, funny thing. Love, funny thing. Action. That funny little symbol will be familiar to some people. Um, from science. Uh, it's the nearest thing I could get on the computer to it. But what it means for me, what I understand it to me, it's, it's not an equal sign, it's an implies sign. So the equation, if you like, is that faith implies love, implies action. That may seem a very deceptively simple notion, but it bides thinking about a lot in terms of why you want to do what you want to do. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Faith proceeds, but is defined, note well, rather as a disposition, an orientation of the soul one is an existence, a human being, not a set of intellectual beliefs. I want to repeat that. Faith is defined rather as a disposition, an orientation of the soul that one is, an existence, a human being, not a set of intellectual beliefs. Tillich used various terms to elucidate. Unconditional concern is probably the best known. I like this one. The state of being grasped by the power of being itself. This is somewhat echoing the work of the 19th century theologian Schleiermacher, whose romantic, capital R, theology of feeling, I studied in ministerial training in Manchester. And this is an antidote to the seeping in of our own needs compromising our action, which in the extreme is the bleeding hearts problem with which, for example, such as the Daily Mail characterises social workers. Compare again with the Epistle of James which I think recognises this. And, for example, 
the words of the Bhagavad Gita in the South Asian religious tradition, motivation for good works matters. In this notion of faith, in practice there is a need for encouragement in this wavering disposition. For example, through regular shared worship, I'm sorry to have to be saying that in this particular context because I know that for many of members of NUF, you can't necessarily get to regular shared worship. But there is that need, I think. And there is a need too to counter discouragement that doing what we can and merely that is somehow not enough. I take comfort in these words, surely known to some of you, of Oscar Romero, the liberation theologian who was assassinated. He wrote, We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realising that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. Well, to end, I offer a caution for any volunteer. As someone once put it, 70% of any job is boring. <laughs> Checking the figures, paying in at the bank, sending the checks, writing the minutes, preparing the agenda properly, making careful notes in the meeting, following up if something promised has been done. If your motivation is ego-driven, then you will soon tire of the task. I grew up with my mother's adage, which of course in early years I more or less dismissed. Duty makes us do things well. Love makes us do them beautifully. I hope someone will want to prove me wrong, say that it's a wicked calumny, but it seems to me today's volunteers, including amongst us, are all too ready to be asking, what is in it for me? And forgetting doing stuff to the glory of God and the service of humankind, as it used to be described. In somewhat more grandiose fashion, I want to really finish with a seemingly prescient quote from Raymond Holt's The Unitarian Contribution to Social Progress in England, originally written 1938, revised edition 1952. And he wrote this. It really socked me when I read this. Men and women in the 20th century will try to resolve their problems in their own way. But if they abandon those ideals of truth, liberty, humanity and democracy, which animated the best minds of the 19th century, the time may come when historians of the future will look back with longing on that century as in some ways a little oasis in the history of humankind. And as later generations painfully take up again the work of try striving to create a society in which the head is held high and the mind is free, they will wonder why those who came before them lock their nerve and threw away the gains of centuries. Friends, don't lose your nerve. Do your bit with love. Thank you for listening.